in my opinion, uh, a great failing or falling short of many sci-fi movies as they often depict spaceflight somewhat unrealistically, despite the fact that they don't really have to, um, other than the fact that maybe the writers just don't know any better. See, I watch a, a fair number of KSP cinematics, but I also like to look at real-world mission proposals, and as sort of KSP 2 videos start to, to, to come online, I sort of wanted to, you know, get involved in that, but unfortunately I don't have advanced access, and I probably don't have even half the computer to run it. Um, so instead I decided I thought I'd make this. Um, there's no people are no doubt already planning KSP2 cinematics. Um, there are a few really easy ways I've sort of picked up over the time uh, that will substantially boost any realism that you of anything that you might want to make. I think the first thing to really pay attention to is how realistic are you actually trying to be? Um, if you're just primarily doing a stock game and then making a video out of it, then you know, really pay any attention to the rest of this and you can go eat a sandwich or something. Uh, however, because this is the expectation of the kind of Kerbal jankiness, um, that you know, it doesn't really make any sense to worry about any realism before the necessity of the game and, and functional stuff in itself. However, cinematics overall do tend to push towards realism just because it it looks cooler. TD channel is actually has a lot of videos across this whole spectrum, so I'm going to use some examples uh, for what I mean. The sort of first level of realism here is, um, as an example, going far with very little. Uh, it's pretty much just a core KSP game, uh, nothing else. In fact, the, the kind of jank inherent to KSP is part of how you make something of this video. Yeah, Apollo Squared is still pretty Kerbal Crazy, but with more elements of realism as, 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 a, as a full Saturn V in it. Uh, Project Andorra, however, we've sort of now crossed this line of realism, um, where paying attention to these sort of realist aspects will actually add to the overall story rather than detract from it. Um, another person who fits into this, uh, this category very well is Xenatrix. Um, in fact, so much that he have often puts disclaimers at the beginning of his videos that uh, it's not supposed to be realistic at all. And then the sort of the fourth level here would be uh, something like Apollo 11, the complete mission. Um, this is a real thing that happened. Um, and as a result, the realism that I'm talking about here sort of comes baked into the mission planning because it already was done uh, in real life. It's this kind of level three realism here that I'm, I'm sort of talking about with this video. So I wanted to start off with the colour. Uh, see, there's sort of, this is a really interesting one because it's both functional but also expressive. Um, it's quite simple in, in principle. So in space, you want your tanks and your habitats to be white. Your thermal systems, so your radiators and maybe your heat shields will be black and your sort of electronic systems will be gold. And for first stages, you sort of your hydrogen systems will be orange due to the unpainted uh, S Sophie that would be on the tanks. Other fuel types will likely be painted white, and you sort of want black and white patterns for roll tracking, but again, only on the first stage. Some nuclear thermal Mars designs have gold foil on the tanks, and I'm not actually sure why. I think it could be either just an illustration of where the tanks are, or also for the same thermal control reasons that you'd put the gold foil on the electronics. However, the most important thing here is that you can really do whatever. I often see realism overhaul players using a particular tank scheme for all of their rockets, which can help tr keep track of things. However, you can really go with whatever here. Um, rule of cool is king, and cinematics are supposed to look cool, so if it looks better to not be all white and gold, then do that. The second one is bought modes. And this is kind of a, a casual statement here that sort of would make a mission more or less dangerous. And I'm going to start with by far the most common one that I see, which is deploying the landing legs on final approach to the surface. You see, if at that moment you discover that your landing legs are jammed, well, obviously you can you can abort. Obviously, it's a lander; it's designed to lift off. Um, but also, if you dis if you try to deploy them much earlier in the mission and you discovered it was jammed, you would not only have more time to figure out how to unjam it, but also you wouldn't be heading towards a planetary surface. This raises an interesting question, because the Apollo lunar lander legs were not deployed until they had already arrived in lunar orbit. Surely, following the logic I've just laid out, the lander legs would have been deployed before that insertion burn. But it turns out the lunar lander is not actually even switched on until after they've arrived in lunar orbit, because 
it's battery powered you can't just waste power like that but it is actually the legs are actually deployed pretty early on in the power on procedure many hours before any undocking would happen interestingly the landing legs on apollo 13 were, de were deployed before the correction burn so I imagine if your lander is also doing the lunar insertion burn, like the LSAM from Constellation, it would probably be deploying the landings before that time. Secondly, docking is dangerous. You see, there's a good chance if you're doing this almost realistic mission that you're going to be docking, if not just a lander, but maybe multiple sections of a vessel at some point. And NASA consider docking a, a sort of necessary risk. Uh, you can sort of see this in, in two particular examples. When rearranging crews, Soyuz or Dragon spacecraft between ports across the ISS over the whole 20 years, that's I've always put all of the crew for that vessel in that spacecraft fully suited up during that maneuver. In fact, NASA would prefer even leaving the ISS completely unmanned during a Soyuz maneuver like happened uh, in during Expedition 15. In fact, they spent 16 hours prepping the station in just in case they were unable to dock and time is expensive especially in space if we take another look at apollo we can see the transposition docking maneuver and obviously this isn't particularly ideal and there's actually only a short window of time before the s4b stage would begin outgassing its leftover propellers and potentially begin to roll uncontrollably but in this case there really isn't any other option you could remove the transmission of docking and have it all one craft, but that's a direct ascent and that would just be too heavy. And this was originally actually what the Nova rocket was for. But also you have to have the crew module on top because the abort system is on top of that and the heat shield also you don't want exposed. So that's underneath the crew module. So you have to shift some stuff around. In fact, early designs for Apollo had the command and lunar modules physically connected with an arm that would line them up. Um, I came across a random video of this online and I eventually had to ask some actual engineers from the time as to what the reason for this was. And actually, uh, it wasn't until after they'd done the rendezvous practice on Gemini that they actually realised it was not as hard as they expected and so they've removed it from the, from the design. Our next one is quite interesting that I don't really think anyone has ever mentioned before. Um, when you're doing orbital assembly, you have multiple sections of a ship to put together. And at some point you will have to decide which one goes first, as in which one is launched first. And while it's never directly written, there is actually preferred order here. And the power and propulsion always goes first, because this allows for orbit raising, orbital corrections and collision avoidance maneuvers. You can see this with the gateway. The crew always go last because launch is dangerous and if anything goes wrong in the assembly or the docking, you don't really want anything up there unnecessarily. Obviously, if you have crew up there for assembly reasons, that isn't quite the same. And while you might want to refuel as late as possible due to boil off in reality, in a game we sort of have to deal with part lag. So if your habitation modules are pushing that lag bar too far, uh, you might want to do some re your complex uh, refueling docking before well, then we have a smaller ship. Overall, the general rule you might want to follow would be power propulsion, truss sections, fuel tanks, habitation, refueling trips, and then crew. Can't really go wrong with that. Similarly, um, EVAs are quite dangerous because there is not only an orbital debris and micrometeorite collision risk, but they're also exhausting uh, can injure your, your astronauts and overall that can lead to a decrease in performance and attention and focus and etc etc not to mention if you're doing this out in deep space the radiation shielding of a, of a spacesuit is much thinner than whatever you can put on a ship so you probably don't want to be doing them at least out in deep space much as as, as much as possible now there were deep space EVAs on the last three Apollo missions to retrieving uh, film canisters from the service module. So unless you're retrieving science experiments or fi maybe fixing something, um, they'll probably be staying inside most of the time. Unless of course you've landed somewhere, at which point there's not really much else to be doing, is there? Uh, on the topic of the heat shields, um, you probably want to cover them up. Um, many deep space uh, mission designs have a emergency capsule on board, either for crew return or various abort reasons. However, I will sometimes see them left exposed to space for a significant portion of a mission. 
Uh, these heat shields are extremely important for overall mission success, and you really, really don't want to risk them being damaged from debris or anything kind of reasons. So often you'll have a service module that flies up with them, so you might as well just keep it on. Uh, tangentially, uh, space planes are very heavy. Um, does it look really, really cool to have a massive space plane on the side of your vessel? Yes. Our space planes are very heavy and also have a massive unprotected heat shield. Also yes. And also, due to the uh, distinct lack of runways in space, not that many reasons to have one really. Um, you can break this rule as much as the others. Uh, you could send a space plane on a different orbit that uh, takes longer but is more efficient if you really, really have to do atmospheric entry. Um, you can do vertical landings, um, lots of options here. I think the, the final sort of, of catch-all of catch-all rules here is a uh, real requires real, is how I phrase this. Um, because the, 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 the craft designs you're using can also affect how realistic everything else has to be. Um, say you have a, a crew section that brings a, a station module down through re-entry. In a regular KSP gameplay, that's not that weird. But if, you're, if you've are if you modded in a, a capsule that's, you know, a dragon capsule, um, you sort of now have to play by the rules as to what a dragon capsule can do. And it can't do this kind of thing. So you've sort of got to remain consistent sort of horizontally across those levels. Uh, similarly, if you if you look at the design of the space station, um, you'll notice that there are the sort of the crude sections all together, and then there's the uh, the truss sections all together, and those things don't really uh, pass through each other at all. They're almost completely different systems, just connected together. And so, when you're designing your 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 crew and where they're going to go, uh, just bear a bit of a thought as to how would a crew member get from this thing to this thing. Um, so you don't want tunnels through fuel tanks or uh, through service modules or stuff because this will add a necessary weight to any real design and also it kind of is a little bit hard to, to sell really um, this is a very common one actually that I do see people paying attention to which is why I sort of tagged it here on here at the end so I uh, I hope this was interesting to you some things you may perhaps not have thought of before um, again uh, I will have put some examples of things in the video that I've seen um, these people, are, I, I love KSP Cinerex, they're fantastic, so um, definitely go watch all those people. Um, none, if, if it feels like I'm calling out anybody, it, that's not the case, you know, a lot of the time you just don't know, um, which is a perfectly fine reason really. Um, so thank you for uh, listening to me ramble again, um, and have fun in KSP 2, I know I will.